Okay, it's it's a little past halfway. I wanted to have a check-in with all the project leaders and so far no one's needed my help on anything. I'm feeling a little left out. So I'm looking for is kind of a, I don't, I don't know what to do, Tim. Is it harder than you thought it was gonna be? It's more work than I could have possibly judged, <laughs> but it's not harder. And it's it, just more. It's just amazing the surprise to me how much of that time is eaten up throughout the day and you look at your watch and oh. it's like, holy crap. It used to be like I looked at my watch and I was like, oh, it's 4.30, can I go home yet? Mm -hmm. Not that it's because I was working on no, the hard game. That says a lot but, about you, okay. Um, <laughs> but now I look at it and I'm like, holy crap, I have that much more to do. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to my actual workload mm -hmm. of, of art. That's why I do this whole thing. Because once in a meeting, Paul asked, what do you do? <laughs> okay, like every, did every one of their update. Yeah. And then as I did, I like, any, any questions? And Paul DuBois said, uh, yeah, what are you doing? And I was like, <laughs> someday I'm going to figure out a way to publicly torture everybody and make them. Perfect. Because it is hard to actually itemize what you do. Like most of it was right. just talking to people. Right. When we have our stand-ups, I'm like, <laughs> I, I tell people like, oh, I'm I've got to do some writing and then I've got to do uh, some orthographic drawing for a character. You know, and those are the two things in your head that you describe to everybody in the morning. You're like, the things that I told you yesterday, I didn't do. And then your explanation is like, what I did was, and you know that you've done a lot of stuff, and it was just all little running around firefighting mm -hmm. throughout the day. But, but you really can't describe exciting. it really. It's so it's exciting just, for me to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Mission accomplished. You don't have to finish the game now. As long as you now understand my updates for Reds. Wait, have you ever led anything before? These are the questions I should have asked before. Oh, this is going to be great. My team is going to be equated to this. I used to teach swimming lessons, mm -hmm. so I used to teach little kids mm -hmm. how to like kick and put their face underwater when they didn't want to do that. <laughs> so um, it was like so it was something I did for a long time. You so put your head on your team, you and pretty you much, shove yeah. Them so like someone doesn't want to program something, you just give them a little nudge, and um, you tell them to blow bubbles while they do it. Yes, <laughs> the yeah, whole time so you're blow, doing so, it, you just blow, blow some bubbles. bubbles, and I push their face into their keyboard. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, 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 I'm going to use uh, that. You want to encourage the people to go in the right direction so you tell them the thing that you like the most about what they're doing mm -hmm. and then you say but this part isn't working instead of just coming flat out like yeah this is wrong you know because yeah. there is something in whatever's been done that's redeemable just being clear about explaining yourself is is the thing that i think keeps people's spirits up and mm -hmm. has got us at a good point for week one i think someone told me once that like you always um, should always say three positive things before you say a negative thing. I don't have time for that. <laughs> it's just the one, <laughs> but like because it is a natural tendency, and you walk up to a, th something. Yeah, the you first kind of assume thing. there's going to be a bunch of good stuff, but then you look at the problem. Like right. that character can't wear a hat right. because so you walk up and you're like, "What's the hat for?" And the person's been working for eight hours on this drawing, and you're like, "Yeah, you just don't yeah, like that's yeah. the first thing." To say. And I think the thing is like people when they're in a creative space. Everybody on my team is an artist, whether or not you're doing visual art. Oh. Um, everyone is doing something that they specifically have a hand in, in creating and forging. And if you come at them and tell them that, you just give them an initial negative thing, they start not listening to you because they kind of get put in a bad mood if mm -hmm. you do that kind of thing. Calling everyone on your team an artist almost makes up for calling them little crying babies in a pool. Little baby artists, <laughs> yeah. I also have another trick I haven't used yet, and that's putting, um, putting a kid that doesn't behave on the side of the pool when it's a cold day. <laughs> <laughs> but you tell them, you tell them, hey, do you want to play popsicle? And they go, mm, popsicles. <laughs> That's horrible. Yeah, Until yeah. that one kid dies of the flu. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, <laughs> do you have any questions for me? Not that I have any advice for you. I don't want to just. I don't know anything about how to do this job. But in case yeah. you had any right. problems with anything that you wondered how. How do you, you know, do it all the time? <laughs> um, no, I think we're in a good place. The game's making good progress. You think you'll have a complete thing. That's one of my things about Amnesia Fortnite. I really want to make sure the thing you end up with at the end is a complete experience. Right. Not like, oh, we got the walking done, so try and imagine what the climbing is like and, you know, like... Right, right. Well, good. I'm glad you're doing well. Yeah. Because you were, I think, our most... Well, you haven't led a project before. No. So we were kind of hoping you were going to be the project that kind of crashed and burned. So right. That... right. All right. Well, you, we'll let you go. Cool. Back to work. This is such a comfy chair. Can I just, <laughs> can I bring my chair in here and the next? No, get out.
Um, I'm, uh, I'm a graphics programmer, so I'm primarily focused on um, graphics for the, um, for the environment and for the characters and a lot of the lighting and so forth. Um, but I'm primarily working on um, these uh, uh, vines here, which we're um, procedurally rendering. We'll uh, be spawning more and more of these vines as you go closer to the Black Lake. Mm. And so at first the forest is fairly friendly and inviting, and the deeper you go into it, the more forbidding and evil it starts to become and so forth. Mm. And it's actually pretty pretty simple. The animators have a rig that they just put a bunch of joints on, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can kind of see where those are right here. Um, and they just curl all the way around the, um, the tree. Each stalk of the vine is just following those joints. Um, and I'm doing a bunch of stuff to kind of make them look, a, to try to make them look a little different for each tree. So instead of literally going through each spine point, I, um, I just move move the actual spine point randomly within um, so a space near the, the one that they place, mm -hmm. and then that's randomly moved differently for each tree. Mm -hmm. So each one is unique because they're being generated on the fly within a certain set of parameters. Yeah, um, yeah, um, exactly, exactly. There are these uh, parameters over here, like the radius and the lifetime, and the thorn radius and the thorn height, and so forth. But this is still pretty much placeholder mm -hmm. from. Um, from what we put in Monday, mm -hmm. and um, that's just wrapping around the tree a couple of times, and it's going all the way up. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of a mistake because our in-game camera is, you know, you really only see yeah. this much of the tree, which is, you know, right about there, even though this whole mm -hmm. upper part um, still has vine growth on it. Yeah. And we can see that. Because we're rendering so much up here that we don't actually see, so there's it's spending a lot of performance on that. that for, for nothing that we that we actually get from it. So that should help a lot. It's actually really nice to come to a modern PC um, from a, a 360 or PS3 console, um, just because the graphics chips are so much more powerful and have so much more memory. So um, it definitely gives us a lot more room to be flexible and try things out. Um, those older consoles really, you have to, to be still pretty um, focused on performance from the beginning. Levi actually had the concept of kind of the brambles and the vines and so forth, and he had a lot of the concept art. I think he's been pretty excited, yeah, especially once, um, I think yesterday, once the thorns were in there, and we kind of tapered the end and so forth, and they looked a lot less like computer graphics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how he felt when uh, when it was just a wireframe, kind of a white line moving around the side. I was excited about that. <laughs> he's not spinning anymore. Maybe. Oh, there he is. Oh. I have no idea what he's doing. He's just like, he's just going crazy. Oh man, that's he's, awesome. He's boogieing down a dance floor. <laughs> I destroyed him. You did. Whoa. You or win the game. Or maybe he destroyed himself. Is that possible? I guess so. Anyway. Let's awesome, get in. Oliver. Keep it up. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I've been spending a lot of time just on visual things, so we have this little um, anamorphic flares where, like, basically, if, if you're a very bright area, it kind of bleeds over the edge and kind of like has this really cool like flares that are kind of like horizontal. But yeah, oh, it's, uh, it's getting there. And the really cool, the other really cool thing is actually um, you can looks through the eyes of a robot, that's another thing I did. And so you can like see what they're doing right now, what they're up to. So this one is, I guess, just trying to find energy sources in the world. So it's just basically moving around, bumping into, the, into walls and then change the direction, going the other direction. I think he's just, he's creating those beacons. So he, his responsibility is to basically go through the world and find those energy sources. And then once he finds one, he uh, puts on a beacon, which is like the thing that you can see from the distance. So for example, there's another one right there. So if I you know, need to find an energy source, I just have to look around me and find those beacons. And you can basically build those automatons that then go around and scan the world and find those energy cores. How does the game look so good after only one week? <laughs> it's uh, having awesome artists on the team and having just generally like a very experienced team makes a huge difference. And you know, people have been making games here in the studio with this with this engine for many years now. So people know how stuff works and they know the quirks and stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah, I don't know. it's all me. Look at this, I created it. <laughs> No, I, w I just wrote some shaders. I give them, uh, but then as I was just saying earlier, like when I usually when I write shaders, like I tend to like completely overdo it with the effects. So everything is completely blown out and glowing and stuff like that. And then the artists come like, oh, that looks pretty cool, but uh, can we tone it down a little bit? And then usually just 
give the effect away to like an artist and then they tweak the parameters to make it actually look look alright and not completely over the top, which is what I tend to do. Oh, um, a shader is basically like a piece of like a little piece of code that runs on a graphics card, um, and it it's basically gets executed for each pixel. So, for example, a good example is like those um, you see when you walk. Here you see like how this this light source kind of bleeds over a little bit in this area, but basically a shader what it does like it figures out in the simplest form to explain it, but it figures out that this pixel should pick up some of the light that is emitted by basically this piece of geometry, and like everything you see in the world, like everything is is executing shaders and to basically figure out what the color should be for individual pixels. So that's what graphics programmers do, um, basically just writing shaders. And it's kind of cool to actually fly above the world and kind of see the oval view as well, because it kind of looks pretty cool. It makes you realize like how many different things are in there as well. Oh, yeah, it's, um, it's almost looks like a discotheque as well. You see that this little scanner there is like, Ooh. Yeah, so. You know, they got up and running really quickly to have something on screen, but it, you know, it takes, I think, almost all of the team. It took them like a week to actually get the gameplay in. So we are now at the stage where we can actually have the core, the core mechanic of building automatons. Like it's just now coming in, so there's a lot of changes still happening, basically. But it's good to see like everything kind of like coming together finally, and you have a game hopefully soon. <laughs> I have to sneak in redbots somewhere as well. <laughs> There's all this junk that's lying around here, so maybe I can just like put them on the wall somewhere, like uh, passed out. And that would be fun. I have to talk to Lee, but it would be fun. Usually with, with AF is we try to find um, some assets that we've used on other games. I was thinking, well, we haven't really done first-person shooter before. No, sorry, it's not a shooter, but first-person uh, game. But we did do some hands in Once Upon a Monster when you like pick up trash and stuff. so there were these hands. So I just went and found those as just sort of a starting point. We just needed to get something in the game. And so I brought those in, uh, created a, a quick uh, rig, and then um, put those in. And so that's basically what we had right here. They were something like this. And these were Lee's, these designs. So we had those early on. We had already done those, so that was really nice. I could just get started on them. And then once they got those in and working, then I just started working on actually modeling out the real hands. This is, this is basically them, um, at least the model finished, so it's, they don't have any textures on them. I just threw some simple shaders on there just so I had some color. Once that was finished, uh, Lee actually yesterday did some, he UV mapped them for me, which was nice of him. On a model, you have all your verts and you have your polygons, and um, when you want to put a texture on there, it needs to know where all the parts of the texture need to go. It allows the textures to be put on um, the model, and so that it's mapped on there correctly. You're breaking out all the coordinates and telling it where to put all the all the different um, colors and uh, and the different textures. They decided on what FOV they wanted the camera to be and where they wanted the camera to be in the game, and then. Um, I just brought in uh, what we call our cutscene camera, which is this camera right here. And uh, uh, well, it basically sits at zero, 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 and that's where the hands sit, just like in the game. Because in the game, the hands attach to the camera, and so uh, and so that gave me my uh, my view, which is this, which is this view. When the player stops moving, we want the hands to be doing something like once in a while, um, just so it doesn't get boring. So this is the idol I was doing this morning. I started doing this one, which is a sort of like a short circuit. So it's <laughs> like the hand stops stops working, or you know, it kind of has a problem, so he has to slam on it and get it working again. And so just these will play once in a while, um, not not too often, but just occasionally, just to mix it up a little bit. And then, um, so then like I was working on it, this was a death. So this is a death that I started working on. So now here you can at least see, see some of the world. Or at least this is a fake world, but it uh, gives you some, something, uh, some reference points. So yeah, it's, they're coming along. There's one other idol that I'm working on today that I won't, I won't spoil that one, but, which should, should be good, which everyone's excited about. We can look at the walk which actually just got in uh, this morning. And so we actually now have, we now have a walk. So this, this is sort of when you're walking around. 
Did you look to any other games in particular to like get this feel down since um, this is kind of new for you? I looked at uh, some Bioshock. Um, I looked at Mirror's Edge just because I like that game so much, but it they don't they hide the hands quite a bit on that. We we're trying to look for things that didn't just have guns all the time because we don't have guns in the hands. And so, um, so but a lot of it I'm just kind of coming up with myself, just what feels what I think feels good. It was kind of fun because I've never done it, so it was actually really cool. It was kind of refreshing for me just to do something new. Like I always want to try on you know just try something else, and so it was cool just to be able to focus on on the hands because. When I do uh, like full body animation, I like to focus on hands anyway, and um, so this is just perfect for that because that's all you have. <laughs> Would you like to carry over to this if this got picked up? Yeah, I mean, I think I think if it was, you know, the size of our games now, you know, if it was like a four year commitment. <laughs> <laughs> be something else, but like a one-year commitment yeah. would be would be pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, plus, I think I would do hopefully do more than hands <laughs> at that point. I'm sure we would. Maybe we'd yeah, maybe like <laughs> we get feet come out once in a while. So yeah, it's uh, it, it's been a good experience. So, so have yeah. you ever led anything before? Yeah, um, I was I was lead level designer on Bioshock Two. So you have so some leadership. I led experience. a team. I led a team of level designers. Cool. Uh, beneath the larger, beneath the, the design director. So you had to be like a heavy sometimes, maybe bad guy. <laughs> did you ever have to like tell someone? Did you have anybody who was like not performing or something like that? I guess there were a few other cases where just yeah, like I don't know, communication wasn't happening or people didn't quite oh. have the right idea about. You know, it was like a combination of needing direction and also needing like needing to be told what to focus on and stuff. Oh. So um, I'm like a real, I don't know, I'm not a pushover, but I'm. A softy. There's this dichotomy, you know, because like really? I don't know. I like yeah. If, You're not General Patton. I would have thought you no. would have really. <laughs> yeah, I go in there. there. Slapped a few people. Yeah, absolutely. Talk yeah. Dirty all the time. Um, but you know, just like I don't know. I'd always rather prefer to just oh. lead by helping. You know, just letting people like letting people's passion for something and mm -hmm. their own. Because presumably, the reason that you hired them in the first place, or that you wanted them on your team, or whatever, is because they're awesome. Presumably. And so how is that leadership different than what you're doing now? First of all, the time thing, just completely, you know, like mm -hmm. any notion of hierarchy really kind of like loses most of its value. Like I think the main role, I think the main value of me being a, a, the project, of having somebody be a project lead on this mm -hmm. is just so that you can resolve deadlocks and so that people like, mm -hmm. if people don't feel strongly about something, they can just look to, they can just say like, okay, well, what do you think? Because we need to make a call on this and mm -hmm. then I can provide that if I haven't already expressed a preference. So um, what has been <laughs> yeah. the biggest surprise so far? Definitely the most positive surprise is how much the idea, um, the initial like bag of ideas that I had um, has changed <clears throat> since being put in front of the team. I knew that it would change somehow like kind of oh. in the abstract, but once everybody started talking about it, it's like a whole bunch of decisions became clear, a whole bunch of things that I thought would be important are like, no, nah, that's not actually a big deal oh. or we don't care about it for this thing. Um, so you're saying you're doing a complete bait and switch with the people who voted for your project? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Just like yeah. now you're doing a trading game, yeah. the trading game from last you're year that didn't get approved. <laughs> Do you think everyone on the team got what you were ta talking about? Everybody having their own slightly different interpretation of it was actually really great uh -huh. because, you know, it ended up like, you know, we were able to take the best of most people's perspectives, you know. Uh -huh. um, an idea gets cooler once you share it with people usually. The most uh, challenging think, thing so far. Well, I woke up today and I'm, I'm getting sick. Uh -oh. I'm totally like, yeah, my throat hurts and my energy and my brain is a little, it's a little harder to focus. So that's going to be a challenge for I the remaining you days. Here. Yeah, oh, man. You, yeah, you're Stanky all infected. Yeah. You're all, yeah, you're all screwed. <laughs> when you think about this as a test of project leaders, like, um, it's all part of what you have to do in a normal, what yeah. I do in my job, which is, you have an idea, get everyone excited about your idea. Yeah, such a variety of different games, and in the first AF, you know, there's always there's always one game that really appeals to the, like the programmers, and one that really appeals to the artists. Yep. yep. Sometimes the one that appeals to programmers has trouble getting any artists to sign on, yep. and vice that, versa. That was, that was me this time and around. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like with a better presentation, I could have, if I had spent some time with a presentation, I could have gotten more artists interested in it. Mm -hmm. You know, that yeah. you know, I'm I'm quite happy with the Seems team like that I that I that I got. In the old days, I actually just let every team go with what they got. Mm -hmm. Cause I was like, well, that's part of it. You know, you didn't get any, you didn't appeal to these people. You didn't get them on you your team. You gotta make a game without an effects artist now <laughs> or something if you didn't yeah. get them, yeah. So you're not cracking from the stress, although your body 
you're putting on a nice shell of like I'm doing fine, but your body's yeah, falling apart yeah. inside. Well, my spirit is unbroken, but maybe <laughs> once my body decays enough. But no, as long as you wait to the end of two weeks before you die. Yeah, that's the important thing. Well, then it's Christmas. I can mm. I can die when it's Christmas. Yeah, and then we can put it that's on your fine. on your tombstone. Maybe a playable yeah. version of your prototype on your tombstone. Yeah, yeah. So people can come by. And yeah, my tombstone does need a D pad mm-hmm. and some buttons. Mm-hmm. D pad is a good name for a grave. There's a lot. Death pad. I'm saying. D pad. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad things are going well. Yeah. You could have come up with a fake thing to ask me about. That's true. So I still feel like I have something to offer. I'm feeling <laughs> un- unnecessary. So just like think of something. Is anything going wrong on your project so far? Um, everything's going pretty smoothly, Damn except it. for um, the, I'm feeling a little under the gun on the programming side of things. It was really important to me to have two dungeons, like one that felt like it was just sort of like cheating and, and sort of lateral thinking puzzles, and then the other one that got into the meteor hacking stuff. The scope of the game is pretty large. I think that we're doing fine on like the systems implementation side. I've just got a lot of work left to do on the content. We've got most of the artists hitting the like environment layout stuff pretty hard, so like hopefully by the end of the week all of the rooms will be built out and, and arted. I'm hoping to, uh, through the end of the week and over the weekend, uh, get all of the like first pass puzzle implementation done so that you can play the game from start to finish and solve all the puzzles. It's stressful, but it's a good stress. Like mm-hmm. This has been perfect for me personally because like AF is two weeks <laughs> <laughs> and so like all of that uh, kind of like navel gazing that you wind up doing on longer lived yeah. projects of like am I doing the right thing like you know does the team what feel like do? yeah like they have clear direction or like people invested in what they're doing it's like it's more like we have two weeks we have to go I've got to make a decision immediately like yeah. Um, yeah, so like that part of it has has been good has but, anything about it been surprising to you Well, it it reinforced something that uh, I knew but had sort of forgotten, which is that your idea is not that good, um, and uh, what matters is the execution, and that when you when you bring really talented people on to help you out with it, like the idea becomes so much better. Like when I first started seeing Razu's like environment concepts coming online, or you know, Mark Mark is such an amazing character designer. Like it doesn't even need the hacking stuff. Like if we were just making a straight (laughs) Zelda ripoff, like the art style and the the tone of the game is going to be so charming. Wait, are you are you prepping us? for cutting all the hacking stuff because it didn't work out. Yeah, it's like... It, I can see this coming. Yeah. They're like, you know, we don't even need this. Remember that whole hacking thing? <laughs> it's silly. It's silly. Because it's a high-level concept that mm-hmm. sounds really cool and then actually turning that into actual puzzles seemed like a hard, like a challenge yeah. to me. But did it turn out to be that challenging? Or do you, do you think they're already it's already proven out that that's like going to be totally doable. It has this interesting balance of like, for the most part, the puzzles just feel like you're using some lateral thinking. Um, mm-hmm. And th- so it's like, I th- I'm feeling like the puzzle design is going to be interesting to people who aren't hackers. Uh, mm-hmm. But there will be like, I don't know, it's less binary than it is in a Zelda puzzle where it's like, oh, you push the block into exactly the right space and now the switch is switched. And it's like, there are lots of ways to approach the problem. Like you just have to kind of solve the general idea. People will probably come up with solutions. That you I- think people will be able to hack it to the point of crashing it? Oh yeah, totally. Really? Yeah. Uh, is that a danger or is that a puzzle solution? Like if you're dying in a boss fight, you're like, yeah, you, you have to it. crash it first. So, then, yeah, it was like, yeah, a boss fight that if you die, it deletes your save and so you have to crash yeah. it before it kills you or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be cool. So. Do you guys, when you exchange the documents and uh, build and things, do you do it by skateboarding down the hallway and handing off floppy disks to each other? <laughs> yeah, wearing it's, like a trench it, coat. It's actually just like the movie Hackers. Like, yeah, uh, we spend most of our time in a fancy three-level arcade playing like 3D racing like games. There's a rave going on. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you've kind of got Angelina Jolie's hair, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah. all you need is a trench coat and skateboards. Is there anything about it that is totally new for you that is, you've never done before? The thing that is new for me is like working with such an expert team, uh, like you know having to spend less time sort of like helping people figure out how to do their jobs. Like uh, it's it's hugely rewarding to be able to you know kind of work with talent and experience of that caliber. Well, yeah, are you comparing it to your old job or to Reds? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My old job. Yeah. And you feel good about the scope of what you. T- Bitten off to get done? Uh, yeah, it's a little much, but um, the, I'd rather it be that than not enough. Paul's actually been doing a bunch of work to kind of harden the engine against crashes, uh-huh. uh, so that when a crash occurs in the game, we can like actually bring up a piece of UI that like explains what happened uh-huh. um, instead of just like the game terminating. Uh, and you'll have the ability to roll back to a save or a checkpoint. Like it's totally fine to uh, change the state in a way that actually legitimate crash, but you're catching it in some bigger system. Exactly. Um, and
Brandon didn't want to make a game that was that simulated hacking. We're gonna, you know, add some tools and it's like we're gonna give you the metaphor that you're hacking on things, gamifying it or sort of abstracting everything away. We wanted to make it so that no, we're not letting you pretend that you're hacking. Like you actually are directly modifying the game state and the game is like running around that. You can either default to being like saving only a small number of things or saving everything except for a small number of things. Normally games would be the former. You know, there are only a certain number of things that you really, really care about. Your character stats, and then a little bit about, you know, where you are in the world, what mission am I in, and you'll just like reboot the current mission. When you load a safe game, it's like, it's like booting the level for the first time. There's a, a feature where you can just say, take the entire chunk of memory and scan through the entire thing, looking for changes between the, the two memory states. Mm -hmm. And that lets you hone in on you know, uh, places in memory where you can poke to produce interesting effects in the game, like some sort of memory diff tool. Mm -hmm. We wanted the player to be able to poke their way into anything that they can get at within the state of the, the Lua interpreter inside Moai. Like on Apple IIs, you could type this command called peek or poke, and you could just like peek at any particular memory address, and you could like poke a value into whatever memory address. And you know, when I was a kid, I had no idea what peek and poke were. Just like that if you poked this thing into right there, then something in the brain of the computer would would just like would change and magic things would happen. But really that's like all Game Genie is doing. It's like it's poking like the proper spot in your brain. You know, like you poke a person like his his you know knee twitches or something like that. So it's kind of like that. Mm -hmm. You know, playing Pokemon. You're like, I want you know more more coins or more health. Mm -hmm. You can take a snapshot and then do something that you know gives you more or less gold or you know reduces the health of some of your Pokemans. Mm -hmm. Things like that, I think, um, bring back a lot of the the magic of computers. Like knowing that it's under the hood. You know, there's actually something that you can just like physically directly control. It's not just you know you write some really high level code, and then magic happens underneath you. And I think that's one of the cool things about this project. It's like we're trying to bring some of that feeling back. I'll still be surprised once it actually works. It's like I see no reason why it wouldn't. But when it actually happens, I'll be like, oh my god, what did I just do? Look at that. <laughs>